To some, it might seem that there could hardly be a less likely starting point for two leading proponents of free market economics than the working class neighborhoods of Putnam and the East End of London. Yet it was here that two youths of the 1920s and early 30s were learning firsthand many of the lessons that would later inspire their lives work. Work that would ultimately serve as an influence on political and social events in Great Britain and around the world. Ralph Harris and Arthur Selden. Both grew up in working class London neighborhoods and developed a profound interest in the fundamental ideas and institutions of a free society with particular regard to the role of markets in solving both economic and social problems. They pursued this interest through the study of economics, and both were influenced early on by the work of Austrian economist and Nobel laureate Friedrich von Hayek. Ralph Harris was a political conservative in his early years, and twice stood as a parliamentary candidate for the Conservative Party. Arthur Selden, like many others who'd grown up in London's East End during the Depression, was a socialist in his early days. But he came to embrace classical liberal ideas while studying at the London School of Economics, where his instructors included Hayek. Both Harris and Selden entered the world of academics. Harris as a lecturer in economics at St. Andrews University, and Selden as a research assistant at the London School of Economics. But their interests were later drawn in another direction. In the mid-1950s, Harris departed his post in the academic world, and Selden left his position as an economic advisor in the brewing industry to begin work with Anthony Fisher. Fisher was a man with a vision of creating an organization dedicated to conducting research into the role of free markets and individual liberty in solving social problems. Fisher's vision of a free market think tank was in part influenced by his contact with Hayek. In 1956, Fisher recruited Ralph Harris to become the director of a fledgling organization, the Institute of Economic Affairs, the IEA. And in 1957, Arthur Selden joined Harris and became the IEA's editorial director. Together, Harris and Selden ran the IEA well into the 1980s. They soon began co-writing a number of publications that gave voice to what were, at the time, rarely heard views of economic reform based on free market principles. Over the next 40 years, their work, as well as the ever-expanding work of the Institute of Economic Affairs, had an enormous influence on governments, public policy, and economic thought including a profound impact on one Margaret Thatcher, who'd been paying special attention to the insights of the IEA since she first met Harris and Selden in the 1960s. Indeed, many of the policies enacted by Thatcher during her tenure as prime minister were the direct result of work being done at the IEA. As the IEA became the model for dozens of organizations like it around the world, the contributions to classical liberalism made by Harris and Selden began to be fully recognized. Ralph Harris was appointed a life peer in the House of Lords, where he now sits as Lord Harris of High Cross. And Arthur Selden was given the honorary title of Commander of the British Empire, one of the highest honors awarded to a citizen of the United Kingdom. Both Harris and Selden continued to serve as directors emeritus of the still vital Institute for Economic Affairs, and both continued to work through their speaking and writing toward a freer society. I was reading recently that Anthony Fisher, who founded the IEA, was once told that he'd hired the last and only two free market economists in all of England. Is that the Here way it seemed to you? <laughs> yes. Um, Economists were thought of as being, as being uh, left-wing, trendy, because the whole of the climate of opinion in those days was statist. It was post-war, when the IEA started in 1957 and there was a socialist government after the war, then there was a Tory government with a large chunk of socialism built in, the consensus, 
And so economists uh, didn't typically challenge that. They assumed that was the way that things were and that you had to rearrange uh, the, the, the deck chairs on the Titanic, in a sense. You had to, you know, had to sort of just offer little bits of advice, but nothing very radical. So that here were a couple of reckless, irresponsible market, full frontal market economists. At the time, did you find it difficult to find an audience? No, um, no, or, or, or yes. Um, the, the young were naturally left wing, I think. They seemed to have m more compassion about the people whose incomes were, were low, uh, and so on. And they tended, I found in, in my days, um, that I was uh, thought to be rather exceptionally hard-hearted. Yeah. I wasn't conscious of the uh, suffering of, of, the, you know, of those uh, who were poor and so on. Uh, it took some time before one had to say things or, or use arguments which were won the confidence of, of the, the uh, students, uh, nine-tenths of whom, Rafe, I think, it, one can say, were left-wing in my days, in the fifties. Uh, uh, I go, b b I go back um, earlier than that. Even in the, the 1930s, I mean, it, it was even worse then, I think. It was even worse. But by the fifties, the a kind of thinking that Rafe and I were beginning to use um, and spread was beginning to be heard. Uh, its impact was rather slow, very slow. It took us 10 or 15 years uh, for the Institute to um, uh, make a mark. Uh, um, uh, because we started off by appearing to be uh, insensitive about the, the, the lowly. Well, let, let, uh, let's dwell on that, Arthur, because, I mean, this is a real part of the battle, is a battle of intentions, it's like the goodies and the baddies. And uh, the display of compassion and concern and all that is stock in trade of all politicians, particularly on the left, of course. And I think Arthur and I, my, my belief is that we were armed against undue sentimentality of that kind because we sprang from working class families. There's no kidding about that. But the idea that uh, the whole of the working class population were incapable of running their own affairs, of making their own decisions, of learning to do better, was offensive to us. I mean, it was a, it was a kind of affront to have these paternalistic Tories or socialists saying that we know best and we can guide the, the workers or the labouring classes or whatever they like to call us. So that we were we were rather sharp about that and paraded our our working class um, confidence, if you like to say. I was appalled by the in insensitivity of governments to the efforts of the... the, the um, working classes to help themselves yeah. by doing all the things that, that we thought, you know, you know that they, that they, that we thought they ought to do. That they were, um, they were most anxious to uh, you know, you know, insure. They used all the opportunities of insurance to, uh, to, to um, uh, safeguard their families in times of, uh, of sickness and um, loss of income and so on. And uh, I began to sense a sort of um, anti-working class sentiment in all political parties. They wanted the state to do these things, and yeah. they didn't like people to do things for themselves. They taught that that only people weren't capable. That's they right. forgot all the history of the, of the working classes. The records are that, that the working classes were sending their children to school by the 1860s. Yeah. They were insured for for, for, for health, uh, health health cover and so on by by, by 1910, uh, 11, when uh, all parties uh, um, in England. The, the uh, main ones, uh, Tory and um, Liberal, uh, so-called, with people like Lloyd George and Churchill and Beveridge uh, at the centre, uh, um, passed the, the famous or infamous Act of, mm. of 1911, which forced the working classes to insure with, with the state, in spite of, of the fact that nine-tenths of them were already covered by private systems. And from then, my... My, my bitterness against all, all politics, which seemed to me to, to be saying, 
you are not competent. You are, you know, we, 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 you need us to ensure that, that you take care of your families, yeah. which was nonsense. The working classes were taking care of themselves. You had a similar experience, Ralph? Uh, no, absolutely, but um, Arthur said that uh, they ignored history. The, the, the paradox is that the trade unions had been a major instrument of mutual aid. Uh, the trade unions coming through after the 1850s, 1860s, developed uh, uh, ph philanthropic things, they developed labour exchanges, actual ways of getting unemployed chaps in their trade into, into jobs. They developed uh, old age benefits. They actually developed insurance schemes. And when the government in 1911, as Arthur said, produced these state schemes of insurance, they used the actuarial calculations of some of the better trade unions to base their contributions and benefit systems on. So that it was all a matter of impatience that you couldn't wait for this to develop in a voluntary way and uh, a spontaneous, natural way, as Hayek would say. You had to enforce a common standard system on everybody and, and compel contributions and let the politicians, for electoral purposes, mm. determine the benefits. Arthur, were there events in your personal life that drew you to your thinking? Yes, there was one, one early on. At my age of nine or ten, my... Uh, um, uh, my foster father died, and I uh, learned from from that event that he had covered his wife and me and others for uh, the insurance sum. And within two days, the, the secretary of the um, Friendly Society, which which had covered us by, by, by insurance, arrived with the huge you know check of, of, of one hundred pounds which looked after us for two or, two or three years. Uh -huh. And that taught me that, that hey, if, if he's doing it, other, uh, others are doing it too. And from that I learned that um, uh, far from a uh, government having to do things, the ordinary people were learning because of their consciousness of their own selves, their wives, their, their families and so on. And from, from that I think I must have learned. That was the early beginning of my suspicion that government was it was doing uh, far too much, and that it should leave people, even those who didn't come from were below, to do things for, for themselves. Do you have a similar sort of experience, yeah. Ralph? My, my dramatic memory was when my mother died, the other end of my li life from, from Arthur's youth, um, and I found in a shoebox four policies. She had four children, my mother, and I found four policies taken out on our birth when we were born for funeral benefit. This fear the working class had that they wouldn't have the money to bury their dead. And uh, so you could take out uh, a, a penny halfpenny a week, not a cent even, uh, a, an insurance policy to pay five pounds on the death of, your, of any of these children. So four children, four policies, sixpence a week altogether, and five pounds on it. Now, A, that was precaution, prudence, and the best kind of working class thrift, if you like. Secondly, when my mother died, the five pounds wasn't worth a bean because of inflation. Inflation was a great enemy of self-provision. That you insured, you had the hope of money, you put money on the shelf for a rainy day, and then inflation would render it useless and their government would have to come in. So. That was one of the reasons that moves things more and more into the public sector. If I remember, in 1949, Anthony Fisher heard you give a talk in Suffolk. Uh -huh. And seven years passed, but in 1949 he told you that he was going to put the money together and start an institute. But it was seven years before that happened. Yes, I had kept a bit in touch with Anthony. I was then working in a university in St Andrews in Scotland. I came down at Holly Times and I met Anthony occasionally. The great thing about Anthony Fisher is that um, he was a nonconformist. Though he had been an Etonian, he was a country gentleman, he had an extensive farm and all of that, but he had this bee in his bonnet that the war had been fought and he had been in the Air Force in the, in the war uh, over freedom and individual self-expression and so forth. And increasingly, uh, the state seemed to be closing in on people, all parties. And so that uh, to meet Anthony was a breath of fresh air. And when he got a bit of cash, 
and said, look, we're ready to go, and start up this institute we've talked about, I mean, almost recklessly, we threw ourselves into this. First me, then Arthur, soon after. Well, Rafe, there had never been a anything like, like, like <laughs> this before. The, the academics, uh, mostly on the left, the mild left, who thought the government ought to expand it itself and so on, were mostly sim uh, sympathisers of, uh, of left-wing uh, thought. We were the only people, it seemed to me at, at the time, to think of our establishing some, something that was revolutionary. We had the nerve to say that all the thinking that was being done by, by the, these um, um, hard-working, hard well-meaning young, young men uh, was, was wrong, it, that they were working on uh, fallacies and that we, we would challenge them. And somehow that was a revolutionary thing to have said even, even before we had uh, published our, our first works. Now you quickly developed a publishing arm and very quickly I think sought out people who would write for you, is that right? Well, uh, even, even, even uh, that uh, took time. Even uh, the, our difficulty in finding uh, people of adequate quality to write the kind of works that we, that we, that we had in mind were so scarce that Rafe and I had to, to join together and write three of the main works <laughs> ourselves in 1958, 9 and, and 60. Those, those were the ones which I think you know, we, we, we wrote um, on hard purchase uh, uh, credit. Um, as you call it in America, we, we wrote books which made their mark on advertising, which was uni universally scorned, wasteful, taught the wrong values and so on. And our th third um, effort in, in those early years, what was the last one? Um, you did pensions. I, I, I did pension, yes, myself. Ah, we started a series of surveys um, from, from, from 1960 into the supposed view that, that all the people were uh, happy to um, the, the pay, high, pay higher taxes uh, in order that government could spend more on schools, health services um, and so on. From, uh, from our learning of, of, of economic thought, we had a doubt about, about all that. And the reason was that, that all the surveys uh, then be, be being done, simply asked, would you pay more tax if the government uh, spent more on schooling and, and, and health services, and, 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 and our pensions um, and other things? And we found that if, you if we introduced the, the, the notion that um, um, that there was another way of financing the welfare services, uh, and that was by, by payment, by charges or fees and so on, uh, that uh, standards of quality would rise. And uh, we, we, we did that uh, work over something like, like 10 years or more. And that began the very evidence that, that we then found that people said, ah, in, in that case, um, I won't p p p pay higher taxes, I'll pay by prices. Um, and th that helped us on our way to show that there were other ways of supplying welfare services. Whom did you try to reach? That is, who was your target uh, audience? Well, I'll tell you. Uh, this is where the financing came in. We hadn't the money to set up a major publishing effort and, and produce books for every man and get them through the bookshops and build up a salesman, sales force and all the rest of it. We had to think, how do we, with a few thousand pounds a year, make any impression? And so our target was, if you like to say frankly, <coughs> was journalists, writers, on good papers, Financial Times, The Times, The Guardian, and so, because if they would review our books, they would multiply the, the effect. And the books were themselves devised. Arthur and I sat down and thought, as students, what kind of book is useful? About 10,000 words, Arthur decided, was a decent read. That's about 40 or 50 pages with prelims. Uh, the book would have to have a reading list for further reading for students. 
the book would have to have footnotes to encourage the student to pursue the matters discussed in more detail if they wished. And it, they had to be presented in a lively form, and they had to be well written, accessible to a good sixth former, last uh, highest grade in, in secondary school, or first year undergraduates. How long was it before you were paid enough attention that you would be attacked in the press? Did that come? I think not much, much notice of us was taken by government people in, in office, in power, until 1966, um, when a minister uh, quoted a paper of ours that argued that the so-called uh, national plan um, of the, the government then uh, was going to lapse or fail. And that was the first paper. We then began to feel that if we managed to get our work known by people in office, um, we would, they would take us more seriously than they seemed, seemed to be doing in the early years. And uh, it, it, from about the mid-60s, I would say that we had a feeling that we were at last being heard. But that was a full 10 years uh, after we started. Well, Arthur is the national plan. National plan. IEA created 19, in operation 1957. National plan, that was the Labour government uh, that came into power in 1964. 65, it put out a circular, a questionnaire to all of industry and business and so forth, asking them how much timber they would need, how much labour they would need, how much exports they were. It was totally preposterous. We published a paper by a lapsed socialist, John Brunner, called The National Plan predicting, before it was published, that it would be a failure because you couldn't operate these macro magnitudes. You had no leverage to influence building, export, ships, and that. And, and that national plan collapsed in nine months. Now, as you can imagine, we do a little background study before we do these interviews, and we find out dark, strange things. In your case, Arthur, why, if I don't miss or have wrong information, once upon a time you were a socialist. Oh, yes. Yes, and it was easy to, to, to be one. See, I lived where, where uh, people who, who, whose incomes were, were low and who, whose living standards were, 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 were low too. And it seemed to me, uh, at the age of 16, perhaps a little bit more than that, and 17, that it was uh, logical, as the socialists then said and taught, that government would, would, would have to, to, to do more to give them money, to give them free services. The, the welfare state was in its infancy, in a sense, uh, and it, it was, it seemed to me, to me, to, to, to my early mind, my, 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 my young man, I, un, I uncritically accepted the, the, the dominant view that it was up to government, and especially a Labour Labour government, because they seemed to, to be saying more about what, 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 what the, what the, what the, the um, workers, or to be given so and so it was natural for the big hearted generous hearted young people uh, to uh, to think that it was the labor party which was known as the, the socialist what made it hard for you to stay a socialist was there one particular event that just was a watershed event for you or was this a gradual process ah my, my illusions were dropped when i went to the the the, the lse um, London School of Economics. As a student, where all the teachers were of the Hayekian types. It was not actually, uh, although, although Hayek lectured um, at me from 1934, from the, the, the age of, of, of 18, 18 um, my, um, uh, from then I abandoned all my illusions that only government could, could, could do all, all the things that the, the people needed. Uh, and I began to uh, switch from the view that, that the state was essential to uh, uh, seeing that, that the state uh, was, was not, not doing them in the way that best uh, suited the diverse circumstances of the, the, the workers. Was it Hayek's views that inspired the two of you most, Ralph? 
Well, for me, it has been Hayek that I go back to uh, again and again for real inspiration. Uh, at this point, you hand me, without the canvas nesting, you oh, hand sure. me the, the book, the, the big book, I think. <laughs> so, this is, uh, is, is something of a Bible for me. It's the Constitution of Liberty, uh, published in, in, uh, in 1960, just after the IA started, and it has a marvellous final chapter called Why I Am Not a Conservative. Though many people thought he was conservative, right wing, not a conservative, but a, a Whig, he calls it, or a Whig or a liberal. And this is the passage that I like to repeat to students. The main merit of the individualism which Adam Smith and his contemporaries advocated is that it is a system under which bad men can do least harm. It is a social system which does not depend for its functioning on our finding good men for running it, or on all men becoming better than they, than they now are, but which makes use of men in all their given variety and complexity, sometimes good, sometimes bad, sometimes intelligent, more often stupid. That is his defense of the free society. I'd like to talk a little about the way you and two, pardon me, the two of you relate now. Yours is a very long-term relationship, and I gather it must be one of the more interesting relationships of your lives. Well, I, I spent most of my working life with, with this man uh, <laughs> for, for 35 years and so on. Um, we bounce off, off each other. He, he always um, made me think hard about, about some of the things I was teaching or thinking at the time, and I then had, had to, to justify it a little bit. A little bit more, 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 more further. I suppose unless we there was a basic sympathy of outlook and hope, uh, it would have been, been difficult for for two men uh, to have lived and worked together in sympathy, with the, the occasional difference of emphasis, not difference of of thought, as it were, but difference of emphasis. He used to say, "Well, no, no, now that's go, go, going too fast," and I used to say, "Well, that's going too slow." This thing is happening faster than you think. We had adjoining rooms and they had open doors that were mostly left open so that we were calling through to one another. And I can't think of anyone of my wide acquaintances that I could have conceivably worked, not even for a year, let alone 35 years, in that close proximity uh, and have as few frictions as, as Arthur and I developed. It was partly for me this working class bond. I don't want to um, become a militant working class lad, but I admired Arthur from his background in the East End of London and as an adopted son, uh, and to see the way that he made and the aspirations that he had for other working class people. That's and I. That's the point. And I, no less, felt quite proud of my working class origins. I had a bit of a chip on my shoulder. If I met public school boys, I would mock their fancy accents, la la da da and all that stuff, um, because these were the people who would condescend to see help the workers along with little state handouts and uh, uh, subsidies and benefits. Of, uh, I gather you divided up responsibilities. You were mostly involved in publishing. After the early um, years, yes, uh, after, after, after the early years, when we had the past, the early five years or so, during which it was difficult to get authors of the right caliber. Uh, so there were some things that, that, that we wrote jointly. Um, after that, um, the, the great virtue and value of Rafe, for me, for, for me personally, for my per personal mission in life, which was to, to, to get the ideas over, was that he was a past master at selling at, at um, um, persuading, at explaining, and so on, but, but audiences of students and others and, uh, and business businessmen, and of course he raised the money. Um, uh, he, he was the source of the money um, uh, which, which, which paid for our costs uh, from about the mid-60s yeah. onwards, I think. Um, so I found my salesman, as it were, he may have found his backroom boy, uh, there was a saying uh, the office here that I ran, ran, ran the engine room. You know, <laughs> I, I worked and down I kept, there. I kept the shop. 
No, but it was, I mean, how much is just pure chance and happy accident, but um, we had a complete division of labour. I would consult Arthur about uh, financial matters and, and all of that, and he would always let me see manuscripts and even proofs and ask for advice and so on. Mm -hmm. But, I mean, he was publications. He said to me, look, Rafe, I run better on a loose rein, and I learned not to try and breathe down his neck too, too uh, fiercely. And on the other hand, he was happy to leave me to, to raise, raise money. The only arguments we ever had is why don't we spend more money on publicity? Why not more on marketing? And it was a good point. If we had had unlimited money, we could have saturated the market with some of our stuff much more quickly than we did. I gather early on there was an important need to be provocative in what you wrote and said in order to gather some further attention. Oh. Mm -hmm. Well, was this a kind of well, conscious he strategy? Was he was but one, among his <sighs> virtues was that he could write well. The fact that he wrote leaders for for the 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 Glasgow Herald, which meant that he wrote well. Whatever he said, he wrote well, and so on. I managed to work up a sort of column as well in the the, the Telegraph, which was the only paper, the uh, national paper, that began to see what we were able, what, yeah. what, 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 what our, right. our aim was. So on. so both of us were were able to popularise write in simple language simply English, with the arguments of our authors. The division of labour was that, I mean, Arthur was an ace editor who always has written lucidly and clearly and in simple, direct, accessible English. No jargon and complexities to keep the unwashed at bay. Sim our authors relied upon Arthur's editing. Hayek said the best thing he ever published was by the IA, which Arthur had just taken a manuscript and just done as he wished with, with that publication. Best thing I ever wrote, said I. So Arthur was perfecting the, these things. I was the old journalist Manke, you know, what thinking of slogans, phrases. So I thought up as well as best I could the titles. So we had yeah. these excitable Famous. titles like The Price of Blood, um, Anything But Action. Uh, think of some other of my... Down with the Poor. Were there any special early successes that you really relished that gave you a sense that, yes, it was beginning to work and work well, that you were progressing? Dennis Lees, who, who got, got his chair a number of years after he, he worked on for us, um, had written a short piece in The Times saying that the desirable range of health services would never, never, never be established unless uh, out of taxes. And that before long, and this was the Times 1962, yeah. before long, the nation and all parties and all schools of thought would have, would have to consider other sources of revenue. Um, he did well after that. Uh, do you remember that? Yes, uh, there, was, there, was a, there was a whole it lot of famous. It made him famous. Many famous. Exactly. There were lots of, lots of comments on that. He's right, he's wrong, he's half right, he's half wrong. But we made news. He did a Hobart paper called Health Through Choice. Uh, which presented the, the classic uh, contrast between a, um, a developing, ingenious, ingenious innovative, uh, uh, private, free-range scheme and this stark state monopoly that we still have. Uh, and, and he became a professor quite soon after that. By the way, we paid these authors peanuts. We hadn't much money anyway. And in the early <laughs> stages, we chose younger economists, and, and, uh, and we paid them a hundred guineas in those days, that was a hundred and five pounds. And that was all, no expenses and trips or treats. Uh, and, and gradually, we had queues of people wanting to write Hobart papers, genuinely, oh, yeah. because they saw it was a way of making progress in academia, of getting attention, and, and making a way. We <laughs> asked them to be economy. daring, no, we asked them to be unconventional, unorthodox, and daring in the analysis of the subject on which they had worked. And we told them to persevere, even if their conclusions were um, were unwelcome, were you know awkward or wouldn't suit the, 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 the establishment. Um, there's one man or two men who wrote the case for charging for blood. Hell broke loose, wicked, unkind. But there was a man who nearly lost his, his, his life because of the, the, there was a shortage of blood. 
and uh, his blood of a rare group uh, took took some time to to you know, to find, and and, and he, he he was saved. But he, but this man um, asked the surgeon, "How is it you are short of short of blood?" And he said, "Oh well, uh, we don't want to charge something as important as blood. You know, we we think that people ought to give it." I said, "But are they giving it free?" He said, "No." I said, "Would you rather?" No, sorry. But the patient said, well, would you rather I had died uh, rather than charge? Oh, he said, that's a difficult question. But what makes you sound so courageous, even daring, is that no one would have known at the time that this would succeed. You might, so to speak, have been out on the street without a job by 1960 because things didn't work out. You uh, took a risk. The answer? Yes. Faith that we, we were right. Faith that the, <laughs> the thinking that was being a, 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 understated, ignored, and so on, but by academia, um, would re-establish itself, and that we are in the, and, and that if we could risk you know, some years of our lives and our wives, uh, uh, in a sense, uh, that we, we would uh, get there in the end. It it was was an act of faith. I have a difference with Arthur. Yes, Arthur said we were born up by faith, and so forth. I would just amend that a tiny bit, at least provisionally, tentatively. It was knowledge. It was not. Once we had read, speak for myself, once I had read Hayek's uh, writings, I saw that it was inconceivable that an efficient economy could ever be established based upon central direction. Because in Hayek's more elaborate formulations, you could never collect enough knowledge at the centre to reach out and, and indicate to all of the independent actors around the economy what they should do about investment, production, exporting, importing, and all of that. We know that the market economy is necessary to bring together the information. It's a, a, an information-sharing system, is the market economy. So that, I mean, really, we did have this more than faith. I mean, we had this knowledge that... Uh, that the economics wouldn't work. But the sequence was, we had faith that knowledge would work. Ah, well done. We had faith that knowledge would work. One thing is clear, ideas have really mattered to you. Which were the ideas that drove you as you began your work together? Ideas, go on, Arthur. Oh, with me, the idea was that only in open markets would people realise the maximum that, well, that, um, merits of the, the, their, the, their, the, their factors. Uh, it's only in markets in the long run that people will do themselves good, good will, will, will do good for, for themselves, their, their, their families or the, their, their, their causes, the church, only by doing good to others. It's because others w will gain from the activities that they offer, or services, or advice, or whatever they offer. It's only if they benefit others that they will do good for themselves and their causes. That's the moral justification of markets. At that time, at least, didn't many people think markets were flat out immoral? No, oh, they thought the markets were solely a device for maximizing your profits at the expense <laughs> of our customers. That's I mean, what the left taught. That's what the left in the markets, it was only government which would have the impetus to do good for you by taking you, your money and, 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 and um, uh, spending it. You would never know who the best uh, um, sellers of services were until you had a, until you had a choice between, between a number of them. The government gives you one choice. It, it tells you, give us your money and we will give you goods and services in which you have no choice and from which you, you, you can't escape. Immoral. The market says, give us your, your, your money or give it to us rather than to our rivals and we will give you more than they will. That is moral. Alas, you need government. But big government is subject to such flaws, incorrigible flaws. Big government is irresponsible government because they can't know all of the circumstances 
uh, of, of the nation, of the society, of the families that they are uh, administering. Big government leads to all kinds of deals behind the backstage deals about policies and that kind of thing. And all the time they're governed not by public interest but by the self-interest of politicians to maintain their power. Now you, you need politicians. But it, the more you can contain politicians into the essential tasks they have to do, the less you tempt them into this vote grabbing and this corruption and, 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 and deceit which is uh, inseparable, inseparable from modern mass, undiscriminating, democratic politics. Government starts too soon. It doesn't wait to see if markets can supply something that, but better or in other ways. It starts soon. Once it's in, it goes much too far. It does more things than it was authorised to do by the vote. And not least of all, once it's in, it stays too long. It goes on and on. The, the welfare state, it goes on and on, whatever the circumstances. It is impossible to make, make government accept the, the logic of the, their function. That, if, that at the most, they have been called for a short time to do a little and to get, get the hell out of, it. <laughs> out of it. And they don't. And, and this is the lesson. This is the lesson it, we have yet to, yet, yet to learn. You've written that cash gives choice and liberty, whereas welfare systems enslave. Could you say something more about that? Yes. Our welfare state gives the uh, poor, the sick, the halt, the lame, the blind, it, it gives them goods, services, which means treating them like children who have no power to choose or to make or have, 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 have a view. You treat them as, as, as though they were age 10 or, or or 12, they have no choice. You, you, take, you, you, you give them a comfort, which, which may work for some time, but you deny them the, um, the, the, the power, the sense that people have the power to, to make a choice and to say, I'd like to try this first before I see which, which is as good, or worse, or better. A welfare state that was sensitive to the feelings of people who were being helped it was is to say you can have either cash or or kind, and you, you take the risk. We think that if you have cash, you will in time learn where to get the best schools, the, doc, the, 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 the doctors, homes, and so on and so on. But it is a symptom and and a symptomatic weakness of all governments that, that we have lived, lived under, that they do prefer but, but to give services, goods and services. But that's the essence of the thing. That is that's, the essence of the welfare state. That's, that's a risk to That is paternalism. That is to say you do treat people as children and you go on teaching, treating them as children. <clears throat> One of my favourite quotes is from Nassau Senior in the last century, who justifies state education as a, a, as a preliminary process of spreading education among current young people so that at some stage, he said, towards the last quarter of the 20th century, people would have learned the value of education and would have wished to pay for it themselves. Now, we've had a century of compulsory, universal, state-provided education. We are constantly informed in the press by researchers that there's a 20% adult illiteracy rate, that uh, half of the children are below their the reading age, uh, they should, uh, the reading skill they should have reached at that age. State education is one of the most terribly uh, flawed, fail, failed industries, services in the whole of this nation. There's no way that a private uh, educational company could have gone on for a hundred years with a worsening output with every sign of failure, and go on being funded and funded. Yet state education can do that. As the 60s progressed, not the least of your efforts involved a growing relationship with Margaret Thatcher. Tell us a little bit about that. I think Arthur was a bit more nervous about this than I was, and I suppose that she must have known. I had never discussed that I had been a Tory candidate, Liberal Unionist candidate, back in Scotland in 1955. But uh, we, we really had no 
intimate relations, no particular relationship with Thatcher uh, until uh, the 1970s. And she didn't, didn't stand out as obviously a coming lass. And the idea of a lady anyway being a prime minister or very prominent in the Tory party uh, would not have uh, struck us as being very plausible. So that it was only in the, in the medium 70s through Keith Joseph as much as anything else that uh, we met Margaret Thatcher and uh, we, we had her with other MPs. We had Labour MPs and, and, uh, and journalists and so forth. But I remember in this room here on this carpet introducing uh, Margaret Thatcher to um, Hayek uh, in the 80s, now when she was Prime Minister. And the, the unkind quip I always make is that um, uh, she's known as being a rather overpowering lady and she sat down like a meek schoolgirl uh, uh, and, and, and listened to Hayek. Uh, and there was a period of unaccustomed silence from Margaret Thatcher. She said nothing for about ten minutes while he deployed his, uh, his, his argument. Well, I've heard this put two ways. One is that you were Thatcherites before her time, and the other is well, there it, wouldn't have been Thatcherism without your ideas. In a sense, we, in the sense that she copied the, some of the things that we had argued for years and years and years, to call it by, by her name, I, I, I don't, you know, we may, it, 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 it's arguable that we anticipated her, but, but, but that's not likely, because in, in her younger years, when they were in, the, in the 60s and the early 30s, there was little, little, little sign that she was going to act on, on, our, on, our, on our thinking. But uh, certainly she is the head of the government that did more in her ten years than any others since the war, including uh, Churchill and Lloyd George yeah. and all the others. And yet she did more for IEA ideas, practically speaking, than any other prime minister. Is this right? Well, yes, it was a, the great thing that had been a feature of our uh, teaching, by the way, going back to the early days of the 1957-58 period, was the requirement to remove the legal privileges of trade unions. Trade unions in Britain uh, had become, in the post-war years, uh, completely in charge of whole industries, the steel industry, the coal industry, the car industry, the shipbuilding industry. And you had the constant strike threat uh, being held over the heads of the uh, employers. And you had the availability of subsidies from the government to prop up industries that had yielded to the strike threat and had been rendered uncompetitive. So you had the government bolstering the power of trade unions to extract unjustified wage increases. I mean, the thing, what well, it was a kind of madness. You looked at it all and wondered how this could be sustained. And, and Thatcher took that one head on. And she, I mean, made war. No mistake about that. And, and to, to this day, even in places like the House of Lords, her name is execrated by the old trade union uh, members of the Labour Party because she defanged them. She took their power away. No strikes without a ballot. No strikes without a ballot. If you strike, you may be sued for damage you impose. If you strike, you can only pursue an industrial dispute in your business, not a political dispute to support another strike in, in the dockyards or somewhere else. She did more to deprive a government of its powers in her Hang turn. On. She did more than, than, than any other government. She did more than any other head of the government to deprive it. It was her government, but uh, you know, one that she inherited, to deprive it of, of the powers that they exercised in, in, in all the, the uh, post-war years uh, until her first year. She did more to de-socialise, to de-nationalise. She, hers is the only government that did more than merely, moderately alter the laws that govern the union's influence or powers. When I had asked uh, about the effects of Margaret Thatcher in terms of her putting into reality or putting into effect a number of your ideas, I sensed that you weren't quite as happy about the way that worked out as perhaps Ralph was. Did I misread you? No, she did much more than, than any other heads of government. But there were, other, there, but there were some things on which I was, had worked, uh, uh, schools, for example. You know, this, these, were, these were my own special pet schemes. And I, 
Uh, there, there, were, there was a great child. Keith Joseph would have done school, school vouchers. To me, the, the welfare state is the worst bane on the backs of the workers. <laughs> it's, the, it's the thing that holds them back. Uh, you know, they give them things instead of having choices. And, so uh, and Keith Joseph what, was interested and was going ahead uh, quite well with, with the idea of giving the working classes money with which to pay for fees at private schools which it was it hadn't had happened before. And he was doing quite well until to the last month or two when it was being considered by the cabinet. I mustn't say this. What, what, what am I doing? All go home. Uh, You've written it in the Voucher Mystery or the Riddle of the Voucher. Oh, OK. It's, it's, it's all there. OK. So he had to confess and told the House of Commons uh, on one, one day, February 1983, that um, although there was general uh, commendation of the idea, which is a common conservative phrase for saying, we love to do it, but it's too damn hard. Uh, um, it, it was thought that there was not going to be a harvest of votes, a harvest of votes uh, in the time that would make it politically uh, profitable. So the whole idea w was, was, was abandoned. But, but, but you know, I, I don't blame her for the things she, she, she didn't do. What, what I'm saying is that there was a lot that she, she did, more than any other leader, but that there, was, that there were some things that some of us had worked on for a long time, and which she said she was interested, and afterwards re regretted that she had not uh, done yeah. them. Again, it's been a real privilege to spend this time with you, and I should probably just ask you one final time if there's any particular thing that you'd like to have linger with us. I think if you feel you are right, you go on arguing until you are established as having told the truth. You can't live, you can't live with the untruth if you feel you have found it. So the truth really matters, popular or not. Yeah, I don't think I would, I, I don't think I would have enjoyed my, my, my life, apart from, from other aspects. If I felt that there was something I could have done, there were, there were truths I felt I could have uh, popularized and had an influence uh, on the, the, the world or uh, our, our friends, our country. I, I think it would have spoiled the enjoyment I, I got out of the, the rest of my life. I mean, I could have turned aside from this place and earned much more, much at some stage, but much more. At the Brewers, which would give me all the wine I wanted in the beer, and, 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 and we're, 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 we're salaries were, were, were very good. Um, it, it wasn't my f f first choice, but uh, I, I could have gone on there. Rafe, uh, he speaks for himself, but Rafe would either have entered Parliament um, or have ended up as the, the editor of the, the, the Times. My last one is this, honestly. The last phase of my life, not yet completed, is occasional attendance at the House of Lords. I meet some people of all parties who are very, very considerable figures, public figures, and, and so forth. I discover that they will go into the lobby when voting time comes to support that for which they have no enthusiasm, to oppose that which they sometimes actually favour. And you see the extent to which important persons <clears throat> no longer feel themselves free to, to say exactly what they think. Now, it's less bad in the House of Lords, of course, than in the House of Commons, where they're slaves of the whips. But it, it does raise up, in my mind, this enormous gratitude to have had what Anthony Fisher called an independent station. He had a few phrases. Anthony Bishop was a Christian scientist, and he was moved by a number of very simple uh, adages, one of which he quoted from Archimedes. He said, give me a lever and I will move the world. Give me a lever and I will move the world. And he thought the IA was the lever and the fulcrum was market forces. He had another phrase, in bad times, things were difficult. And he would say, one of his sayings from his, his Christian science, he said, there is not enough darkness in the whole world to extinguish the light of a single candle. And you suddenly glowed 
Oh, incandescent to a candle, very <laughs> pitch black. I mean, Attlee was an enormous inspiration, but this was so true, and his, you knew exactly, transparently, exactly what this man believed, and I hope he felt the same of us. Well, many of us believe that the IEA has been that candle, and how shall I put it, the two of you have been its flames. Thank you very much for our time together. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.